They flooded 75 square miles of bone-dry desert with seawater on purpose. 26 billion gallons poured into a canyon that hadn't seen water in decades. Scientists called it reckless. One year later, fish returned by the millions. Birds darkened the skies. Underwater forests emerged where nothing had grown for generations. A lifeless wasteland became a thriving ecosystem almost overnight. But then, something unexpected happened. Something that changed everything we thought we knew about bringing dead places back to life. Let's dive in. Did you know that coastal dead zones have quadrupled worldwide since 1950? The Salton Sea region in Southern California was once a vibrant wetland ecosystem, supporting over 400 bird species and massive fish populations. But decades of agricultural runoff, reduced water flow from the Colorado River, and relentless evaporation turned this ecological paradise into a toxic wasteland. By 2020, the water level had dropped 15 feet, exposing 40,000 acres of lake bed. The exposed sediment released clouds of toxic dust containing arsenic, selenium, and pesticide residues into the air, creating one of the worst air quality zones in America. Over 650,000 people in surrounding communities suffered respiratory illnesses, at rates 20% higher than the national average. The ecological collapse was catastrophic. Fish populations crashed from 100 million to fewer than 3 million. Bird species that once migrated through by the hundreds of thousands simply stopped coming. The tilapia that once thrived died by the millions as salinity levels doubled. What was left behind was a shrinking, hypersaline lake surrounded by miles of cracked, poisonous mud, a monument to environmental failure. Conservation groups tried everything. Small-scale water diversions from nearby agricultural drainage brought temporary relief, but the volume was laughably insufficient. Just 50,000 acre-feet annually, when the sea was losing 1.3 million acre-feet to evaporation every year. That's like trying to fill a bathtub with an eyedropper while the drain is wide open. Natural tidal restoration projects were proposed, but the Salton Sea sits 226 feet below sea level and is separated from the Pacific Ocean by mountain ranges and 50 miles of desert. Building canals would cost tens of billions and face insurmountable engineering challenges. The idea died before breaking ground. Artificial reef projects attempted to provide habitat structures, but without addressing the core problem, lack of water and toxic salinity levels, these reefs became graveyards. Protected area designations sounded good on paper, but meant nothing when the ecosystem itself was collapsing. Birds can't nest on dried lake bed. Fish can't spawn in water so salty it rivals the Dead Sea. Every conventional approach failed because they treated symptoms rather than the disease. The ecosystem needed one thing above all, massive volumes of water to dilute toxicity, restore depth, and recreate the conditions where life could flourish again. In 2021, a coalition of environmental scientists, engineers, and state water agencies proposed something radical. Pump seawater directly from the Gulf of California through a 90-mile pipeline system, flooding controlled sections of the dried estuary with 26 billion gallons of Pacific Ocean water over 18 months. The plan would recreate a functioning saltwater ecosystem from scratch in one of the most degraded landscapes in North America. The inspiration came from natural tidal estuaries worldwide and historical precedents like the Colorado River Delta, which once created vast wetlands before damming dried it out. Scientists believed rapid transformation was possible because saltwater ecosystems are remarkably resilient. Given the right conditions, proper salinity, adequate depth, nutrient flow, marine life colonizes quickly. The Gulf of California teemed with biodiversity just 90 miles away. All they needed was a highway for nature to return. Geographic advantages made the location ideal. The dried estuary already had natural basin to Topography, meaning water would pool and spread without extensive earthworks. Proximity to the Gulf meant relatively short pipeline distances compared to alternatives. And critically, the underlying geology could handle saltwater infiltration without threatening freshwater aquifers. This area was naturally saline anyway. The engineering plan was audacious. Massive pumping infrastructure would move seawater from the Gulf of California's northern reaches through a 90-mile pipeline network capable of delivering 50 million gallons daily at peak capacity. That's equivalent to the daily water consumption of 350,000 American households. Except this water wasn't for drinking, it was for resurrection. The pipeline system consisted of 72-inch diameter steel pipes buried 10 feet underground to avoid thermal expansion in the desert heat. Three primary pumping stations, each generating 15,000 horsepower 
pushed water uphill against gravity and friction losses. The elevation gain was 226 feet, essentially creating a river that flows upward through the desert. Controlled flooding zones were established using existing topography and new levee systems. Water would be introduced gradually into segmented basins, allowing scientists to monitor salinity, temperature, and biological response before flooding additional sections. This phased approach meant if something went wrong in Zone 1, Zones 2 through 5 remained protected. The scale is staggering. Over 18 months, 26 billion gallons would flood the restoration area, enough water to fill 39,000 Olympic swimming pools or cover Manhattan Island eight feet deep. In comparison, this single project moves more seawater inland than California's entire desalination industry produces in freshwater annually. Embedded throughout were 200 automated monitoring stations tracking water quality, dissolved oxygen, salinity levels, temperature, and pH in real time. Remote cameras captured wildlife activity. Acoustic sensors monitored fish populations. This wasn't just restoration. It was a living laboratory generating terabytes of data on ecosystem recovery. Three primary pumping stations anchor the system each a fortress of concrete and steel, housing eight massive pumps operating in synchronized rotation to prevent overheating. Total power requirements hit 45 megawatts at full capacity, enough electricity to power 35,000 American homes. The energy came from a dedicated solar farm covering 400 acres nearby, producing 60 megawatts during peak sunlight with battery storage handling overnight operations. Filtration systems at the intake point screened out jellyfish, larger fish, and debris that could damage pumps or introduce invasive species prematurely. The filters weren't about purification, seawater was entering as seawater, but about protecting infrastructure and controlling which species entered when. Levees and flow control structures created a sophisticated water management network. Adjustable gates allowed operators to direct flow, control water levels in different zones, and respond to unexpected algal blooms or salinity spikes. Access roads crisscrossed the restoration area, enabling maintenance crews to reach any section within 20 minutes. Research stations positioned at strategic intervals housed teams of biologists, hydrologists, and environmental engineers conducting round-the-clock observations. Observation platforms elevated above the water allowed scientists to survey the emerging ecosystem without disturbing it. Total construction costs reached $850 million. Expensive, but cheaper than proposed alternatives like building a canal through mountain ranges or endless agricultural drainage diversions. The timeline was aggressive. 14 months of construction, followed by 18 months of controlled flooding. A workforce of 2,000 people built the infrastructure, from pipeline welders to solar panel installers. The biggest engineering challenges weren't the pumps or pipes. It was preventing uncontrolled salt infiltration into surrounding areas. Engineered clay barriers and subsurface monitoring wells ensured salt water stayed within designated zones. Pump maintenance in 120 degree Fahrenheit summer heat required specialized cooling systems and rotation schedules to prevent equipment failure. Within six months, the transformation began. Water beetles and brine shrimp appeared first, arriving as eggs carried by birds from coastal wetlands. These tiny pioneers exploded in population, creating a food web foundation. By month eight, small fish species, killifish and gobies, were documented in monitoring surveys, having swum through intake filters or been carried as eggs. The biodiversity explosion accelerated dramatically. After one year, species counts jumped from zero to over 320 documented species, including 89 bird species species, 31 fish species, 47 invertebrate species, and 12 types of marine vegetation. Pelicans and cormorants established nesting colonies on newly formed islands. Herons and egrets returned by the thousands. Underwater surveys captured footage of juvenile sharks and rays navigating the new estuary. Marine vegetation, salt marsh grasses, eelgrass beds, and algae communities established faster than predicted. Eelgrass meadows covered 1-200 acres within a year, creating nursery habitat for fish and crustaceans. These underwater forests became carbon capture machines, sequestering an estimated 15 thousand tons of carbon dioxide annually, equivalent to removing 3,000 cars from the road. The economic revival was equally dramatic. Sport fishing returned within 18 months, generating $12 million in tourism
tourism revenue annually as anglers pursued Corvina, Croker, and Sierra mackerel. Birdwatching tourism exploded, bringing 40,000 visitors yearly to witness the spectacle of hundreds of thousands of migrating birds, darkening the skies during seasonal flyways. Local communities experienced transformation. The fishing industry, dormant for decades, created 400 permanent jobs in boat operations, fish processing, and tourism services. Research tourism brought international scientists, generating revenue for hotels, restaurants, and guide services. The restoration project itself employed 150 full-time staff in maintenance, monitoring, and environmental management. Climate resilience benefits emerged immediately. The restored wetland acted as a natural storm buffer, absorbing wave energy during rare but devastating tropical storm surges. Flood protection for nearby agricultural areas improved measurably, and the blueprint proved that large-scale saltwater ecosystem restoration was feasible, potentially applicable to 100 similar dead zones identified globally. The annual operational budget tells a sobering story. $45 million yearly for pumping operations, maintenance, and monitoring. That's just to keep the water flowing. Energy costs alone consume $18 million annually, despite solar power battery replacements, backup generators, and grid connection fees add up relentlessly. History teaches harsh lessons about mega-project costs. California's high-speed rail ballooned from $33 billion to over $100 billion. Boston's Big Dig exploded from $2.6 billion to $24 billion. Cost overruns averaging 50% are standard for large infrastructure projects. The seawater restoration secured initial funding, but ongoing operational costs over decades remain uncertain. Economic benefits sound impressive, 12 million in fishing, tourism revenue, but recovering the $850 million construction cost takes 70 years at current rates, assuming benefits don't decline, and funding is perpetually vulnerable. Budget cuts, political shifts, or competing priorities could slash maintenance funding, risking rapid ecosystem collapse if pumping stops. Environmental risks lurk beneath the success stories. Invasive species entered with the seawater. Asian green mussels and Pacific oysters now compete with native species for space and food. While biodiversity increased overall, some invasive populations spread faster than native species recovered, potentially creating long-term ecological imbalances nobody predicted. Salt contamination remains an existential threat. Despite engineered barriers, groundwater monitoring detected elevated salinity levels in three observation wells within two miles of the restoration zone. If saltwater breaches containment and infiltrates agricultural areas, it could contaminate irrigation water for farms, producing $800 million in crops annually. The risk is low, but catastrophic if realized. Unintended ecosystem disruptions emerged. The introduced saltwater attracted predatory bird species that began preying on threatened desert pupfish populations in adjacent freshwater springs, an outcome scientists never anticipated. Managing these cascading effects requires constant intervention, raising questions about whether this is restoration or simply creating a new, human-dependent ecosystem. Algal blooms appeared twice in the first year when nutrient levels spiked. While quickly controlled through adjusted water flow and oxygenation systems, these blooms consume dissolved oxygen, killing fish in localized areas. Critics argue the project is playing God, creating an artificial ecosystem requiring perpetual human management rather than letting nature find its own balance. Monitoring data from year one reveals a mixed picture. Species counts exceeded predictions. 320 documented species versus 200 projected. Fish populations reached 8 million, tripling expectations. Eelgrass coverage hit 1,200 acres against a target of 800. By conventional metrics, the restoration succeeded spectacularly. Unexpected successes included the arrival of dolphin pods, which weren't expected for five years, but appeared in month 11, feeding on abundant fish populations. Osprey nesting pairs quadrupled projections, and certain algae species established that naturally filter heavy metals from sediment providing free remediation of legacy pollution. But unexpected failures tempered celebrations. Three native fish species projected to return never appeared, potentially outcompeted by faster colonizing invasive species. Algae problems required more active management than anticipated, and certain bird species altered migration patterns, skipping the restoration area entirely for reasons scientists don't fully understand. Current ecological health scores rate the system at 72 out of 100, higher than the predicted 65, but below the hoped for 80. Water quality metrics show dissolved oxygen at healthy levels, salinity properly balanced, and temperature within ideal ranges. Species diversity exceeds expectations, but questions remain about long-term stability and whether the system is self-sustaining 
or merely life support dependent on continuous pumping. Budget. Status shows the project 8% over initial operational projections. Manageable but concerning. Equipment failures happen more frequently than modeled, requiring unplanned maintenance spending. Scientists express cautious optimism, tempered by awareness that year one is the honeymoon period. The real test comes in years five through 10, when initial colonization excitement fades and ecosystem stability gets tested. Projections for years two through five include continued species accumulation, establishment of full food web complexity, and gradually reducing active management as the ecosystem self-regulates. But scientists acknowledge uncertainty. Nobody has done this at this scale before. The data is encouraging, but the sample size is one. International environmental organizations hailed the project as groundbreaking. The World Wildlife Fund called it the most ambitious coastal restoration ever attempted, praising the bold vision and sophisticated monitoring. Restoration ecologists worldwide study the data, seeking lessons for their own dying estuaries. Seven countries with similar degraded ecosystems are watching intensely. The Aral Sea in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, once the world's fourth largest lake, now 90% gone, represents an even more catastrophic collapse. Officials from both nations visited the restoration site, discussing adapting the model. The Murray-Darling Basin in Australia, suffering from agricultural water diversion and drought, sent scientific delegations to evaluate feasibility. Chile's Atacama coastal wetlands, Mexico's upper Gulf of California, and Iran's Lake Ormia all face similar crises. Each could theoretically employ seawater pumping to recreate lost ecosystems. The technology isn't proprietary, the engineering is proven. The question is whether political will and funding can replicate the commitment. But critics emerged loudly. Environmental groups argued the project sets a dangerous precedent, that degraded ecosystems can simply be replaced with engineered substitutes rather than preventing degradation initially. Some called it ecological hubris, questioning whether humans should manufacture ecosystems rather than protecting natural ones. The scientific community split sharply. Leading restoration ecologists praised the innovation and results, calling it a potential breakthrough for reversing environmental collapse. But conservation biologists warned about unintended consequences, arguing that creating artificial ecosystems dependent on perpetual human intervention isn't true restoration. It's elaborate life support. Neighboring agricultural regions expressed concern about water diversion from the Gulf. While the volume is tiny compared to ocean size, precedent worries them. If this succeeds, will other projects divert more water, potentially affecting coastal ecosystems? International maritime law questions emerged about whether nations can pump unlimited seawater inland. UN Environmental agencies issued cautiously supportive statements, acknowledging the project's innovation while emphasizing that prevention remains superior to restoration. Media coverage globally ranged from celebratory to skeptical, with documentaries, scientific journals, and news features debating whether this represents humanity's future or a costly distraction from addressing root causes. The ecosystem is alive, thriving even, but survival beyond five years remains uncertain. Climate change threatens to alter Gulf of California water temperatures and salinity levels potentially destabilizing the carefully balanced restoration. Extreme heat waves could evaporate water faster than pumps can replace it. Tropical storms could flood the area with freshwater runoff, crashing salinity levels and killing marine species. Long-term sustainability hinges on sustained funding, political support, and ecosystem resilience nobody can guarantee. The 10-year outlook is hopeful, but clouded by unknowns. Will invasive species outcompete natives entirely? Will the system achieve true self-regulation or require perpetual intervention? Can operational costs be reduced as solar technology improves and pumps become more efficient? Expansion plans exist on paper, scaling up to flood an additional 200 square miles, creating a massive saltwater ecosystem rivaling San Francisco Bay in size. But expansion depends on proving the first phase succeeds long term. If species diversity crashes in year five, expansion dies. If costs spiral or environmental problems emerge, the project could be scaled back or even shut down entirely. So what do you think? Is this the future of ecological restoration? Bold human intervention rescuing collapsed ecosystems using engineering and determination? Or is it a costly gamble, creating artificial nature, dependent on perpetual life support, distracting from the harder work of preventing environmental destruction in the first place? Would you support pumping billions of gallons of seawater to resurrect a dead ecosystem near you? 
The next decade will determine if this miracle becomes permanent or if nature ultimately rejects our intervention. Leave a comment below sharing your thoughts on whether engineering can truly restore what humans destroyed. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss more incredible stories about the mega projects and environmental experiments reshaping our planet's future.